Henrik, who is a professor at Stockholm University. And he's going to really also a little bit of break the fairy tale myth on how slow or fast trapped ions can be. OK. Um, I think microphone should be working, so everyone understands me? Perfect. OK, welcome, everybody. Um, so I'll give a talk about trapped ions uh, for quantum computation. Uh, and I will introduce a special system for that, uh, trapped Rydberg ions, which combines trapped ions and Rydberg, Rydberg interaction technology. Um, so here in the, in the picture, I tried to make it a little bit brighter, and I switched off the light. In the center, you might see if blue spot. Actually, if you look here on the screen later on, you will actually see a string of ions there, individually, next to each other. It's taken with a normal camera. Uh, it's strontium ions, which fluoresce at 422 nanometers. So it's not so easy to see them with the eye. Basically, the eye is not sensitive enough to see them with a microscope objective or anything like that. But with a normal camera, you can, you can take pictures with a, with a micro objective. So, um, if you want to see the ions individually later on, just come, come down and look at the screen. OK, so to not make the atmosphere here too sleepy, maybe let's switch, off the light, switch on the light again. Um, OK, so these are the ions that we're working with. Uh, strontium ions, as I said, they're fluorescing blue. Uh, here you see the electrodes of the, of the trap. So the, there we apply high voltages, radio frequency voltages, uh, to trap these ions. The ones who have been at a school with, in, in Thomas Monza's uh, presentation, he explains more details how to trap ions and so on with uh, the, the oscillating electric fields. Uh, basically, it's like a, a, um, a sh saddle potential that is oscillating in time, and due to that, the ions stay trapped in the center. What do you mean this potential to be oscillating in time? So oscillating in time, we apply voltages on these electrodes. So on, actually, there's four electrodes here. You see two of them from the side now. And we apply to two opposing electrodes, we apply a voltage on the order of 1,000 volt oscillating in time with a frequency of uh, around 10 to 20 megahertz. So it's a, it's a radio frequency signal. And uh, we use an uh, electronic resonator, basically, to, to get high enough voltages on these electrodes without applying now really, really high currents and voltages there on the, on the electrodes. So it's an electronic circuit there that generates this high voltage directly next to it. OK, so for once, for the people who know what a quadrupole mass filter is and who haven't been in, in Thomas Monza's talk, basically it's a quadrupole, ma quadrupole mass filter uh, which traps the ions in the center just by adding two electrodes here on the side that confine the ions to the side. OK, um, the ions, of course, are charged atoms, strontium atoms, and they repel each other. And due to Coulomb repulsion, they stay at a distance. So usually the distances between these ions is on the order of five micrometers uh, for the typical voltages that we apply. So you basically need a good kind of microscope or something like that to individually resolve them. OK. So give a bit of an outline of my talk. Um, so I will explain, first introduce you the system of trapped ions for the people who haven't been at the school quickly what are trapped ions, uh, what uh, people are people usually doing for doing quantum computation on these systems. And then I will also introduce what we do with Rydberg ions and Rydberg interaction, and what are the advantages of the system. OK. So trapped ions, basically, or quantum computation in general, because, uh, of course, it, it's the school on quantum computation. Give a, I give a quick introduction to that. Uh, so if we look at normal classical computers, 
Then the classical computers get the, the structures, the transistors of, of, of the classical computers get smaller and smaller with time. So the, the, the technical progress is really, really rapidly. So every four years or something like that, the size of these transistors halves. So uh, this is an exponential scaling with time. Of course, people are, the, the, the companies are putting more and more money into that to actually follow this scaling. Uh, but uh, so it's getting more and more expensive. So it's, it's more and more difficult also to make these structures smaller and smaller. And at the moment, we are at three nanometer structures for these transistors. And if you extrapolate that over the years, uh, the, the history of the, the recent years, um, actually at the time of 2040, 2050, you will reach the size of an atom. So of course, this cannot continue infinitely. At some point, we need a different technology because I guess we cannot build a transistor from single atoms. On the other hand side, of course, if you go to such small structures, at some point, you will have quantum effects happening in, in, in these small structures. And uh, only from that, you actually have to ask at some point, what do these quantum effects actually, what, what can we do with that maybe? Can we use it? And uh, due to that, people also have been thinking about quantum comp computers. OK, on the other hand side, usually smaller is faster because the distances between those, those transistors are smaller. Of course, you can send information faster between transistor, from transistor to transistor. But actually, if you look at the recent years, these processes do not get faster anymore. You ha can look at the, the gigahertz, the, the, the clock rates that these uh, uh, chips have, and they don't go up anymore. And the reason for that is that they heat up due to the currents that are flowing in these transistors. And the thermal management is actually a problem, technical problem, and uh, they cannot make it much faster with silicon technology. OK, so getting smaller, of course, gives you more transistors, but you don't get so much faster anymore. OK, what is quantum computation? Quantum computation is if you use quantum bits instead of classical bits. So a classical bits is usually zero or one. A quantum bit is some quantum system where you also can encode zero or one, but also superpositions of zero and ones. Because you have quantum states, for instance, an electron circling around an atom can be in a lower orbital or in a higher, higher orbital. And these two states can encode quantum states, so quantum bits, so either a state zero or a state one. And uh, of course, in quantum mechanics, you can also generate superpositions. So you can generate superpositions of the ground state and excited state, for instance. And this is an additional degree of freedom that you usually don't have in a classic computer. OK, so why do we use trapped ions for that? Basically, um, trapped ions, each of these atoms can encode a quantum bit in the electronic structure of these, uh, of these uh, ions. So for instance, here in strontium-88, the ions that we are using, you have an S1 half ground state and a D5 half excited state. And the D5 half excited state, it's a D state. Usually, if you know atomic physics, a D state would usually decay first to P level and then to an S level. But in strontium ions, there's no lower P level anymore. Okay, so uh, the D level would need to actually go up to go down in the end. And due to that, the lifetime of this D level is quite long. So for strontium, the lifetime of these D5 half levels is 0.4 seconds, which means a state or even a superposition of these two states here can in principle live 0.4 seconds till it decays by spontaneous emission. Which means you have a qubit here encoded for quite a long time. And uh, with that, you can now do quantum computation. Uh, we have a laser directly on this transition that drives directly this transition. Even so, it's a, it's a quadrupole transition. You can still drive it even uh, still with a laser. Uh, if you want to know more about why and whatever, I can explain you later. Uh, so we can drive transitions really between these two levels. And uh, by that, we can coherently generate different states, superpositions of these zero and one states. So if we want to detect our qubit, we apply another laser. The laser drives the transition to this P1 half excited state. 
And from there, it decays. And it decays mostly back to the S1 half ground state. So basically, what we have, of course, it can also decay to some other level here. But from there, we can pump it back. So most of the time, it decays on this level. And it scatters a lot of photons. So we can see these photons. And these are the photons that you have seen on the first picture. This is the blue fluorescence of these ions that we, we've seen in this, in this uh, first image. Uh, and uh, what you can, the, the number of photons that are scattered there are on the order of 10 million photons per second. So that's quite a lot of photons. And if you use a camera or uh, some photomultiplier detector, you can detect these photons. And with that, you can actually say, was it in this S1 half ground state, in the qubit state one, or was it in the state zero up there? Because if it was in state one, it will scatter these photons. But if it was in state zero, this laser doesn't drive any transition further up. So it doesn't scatter photons. And due to that, this state here stays dark, while this state here is bright. So by scattering photons, we can actually distinguish these two qubit states, these two quantum states. And uh, if we see fluorescence, we know it was here. If we don't see fluorescence, it was up there. So by that, we have a measurement mechanism to detect the quantum state. OK, if you want to do quantum computation, quantum computation is, of course, there's different models how to do quantum computation. One model is the so-called circuit model. A circuit model means it's similar to a classical computer. You have not operations, uh, NAND operations on a classic computer. Here you have individual qubit manipulations, individual qubit gates. And uh, you apply these qubit gates one after the other on these different qubits here. Uh, and uh, of course, you first need to prepare the qubit in a specific states. Then you apply these gates. And in the end, you get an out, out, uh, an, a result. And you can measure the quantum state. Um, Schrodinger equation is usually means you have a unitary time evolution. And here, that means all of these gates here basically need to be unitary time evolution, unitary uh, transformations on these individual qubits. And for doing any arbitrary unitary transformation on these qubits from any arbitrary initial state to any arbitrary final state, basically any arbitrary calculation, you need a specific set of operations. And for a specific set of operations, arbitrary single qubit rotations, for instance, and a specific entanglement operation between two qubits, you can show that you can do any arbitrary calculation. Okay, So this is the set of operations that you need. And if you have this set of operations, you can do any arbitrary calculation. Of course, um, basically, if you have a quantum system, and you can do quantum calculations. Classical computer is, of course, only zero and ones. There's no superposition. In principle, it's a subset of such calculations. So in principle, such unitary transformation is something more general. Okay? So it's, a, it's something where you can do something extra. The previous slide, the previous one. The previous of that? Uh, sorry, that one? You have a one qubit system there? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a bit confused because of this additional state of strontium. This so it here? seems that to be a three level system. Yes. And I hope if it's a qubit, it's just a two level system. Or not. So the qubit, of course, only needs to be a two level system. Mm -hmm. But usually you need additional system, you need additional levels so that you can detect, for instance, the quantum state. Or you can also use some additional levels to do some additional operations that you could not use only with a qubit state. But in the end, you will bring it back to the qubit Hilbert space so that it stays, the calculation stays in the qubit Hilbert space. So in the end, what, what you do here is, well, this is, of course, for detection, you just need one, want, want to distinguish these two qubit states. So there, anyway, you don't need this additional level, or this additional level just helps you to project onto these two levels. Uh, tell me if I am, I'm wrong or not. Uh, with this additional state, you can uh, fix uh, w which precise uh, state the qubit is. I mean, this linear combination of zero and one. Uh. So uh, with the additional level, we detect. 
Right? So it's, it's uh, we, we only want to know, was it here after the calculation, or was it there after the calculation? And for that, we now apply an additional laser, which scatters photons. And one scattered photon here already means the atom actually was here because it was able to scatter a photon. So the first self-scattered photon already tells you it was in this state. If you wait and wait and wait and you don't get a photon, then it was most likely up here because the laser would have scattered already many, many photons. Okay. Okay. So with that, you, you actually know after a certain amount of time were there scattered photons or were there not scattered photons? And due to the scattered photons, you actually know in which state it was. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, how do we do now the calculation? So I told you we have a laser directly driving this transition between this state one and the state zero. Uh, and by applying this laser for a certain amount of time on design, resonantly to this transition, we can now coherently uh, absorb photons from this laser and emit it by stimulated emission again. And this is, if it absorbs, it goes to the excited state, if it absorbs photons. If it stimulates, it emits photon, it goes back to the ground state. And we actually observe here a coherent time evolution, which means it actually oscillates between these two levels if we just apply this laser for a certain amount of time. Okay. Um, the D is the upper state, the zero state, and the S is the down, lower state, the one state, exactly. So if we then wait for a certain amount of time and we want to prepare a, a superposition state, we just switch on our laser for this certain amount of time. For instance, if we want to uh, generate a zero plus one state, a superposition, equal superposition, we just wait a certain amount of time till this state is generated. And then we switch off our laser, and then the state is generated. So it does a rotation from the, zero, the, the one state to zero plus one state. Okay. So this is a rotation of this qubit. And of course, a D state, if it was in the, in the upper state and the zero state, if you apply this laser for a certain amount of time, it would actually go to the S minus, uh, zero minus one state. So it would go, so from, from, from S state, it would go to S plus one, uh, and from D state, it would go to S minus one. So it would rotate the whole Hilbert state in a specific direction. And what is the energy gap of the two states? What is the? The energy gap between the two states is very, very long, very, 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 quite a lot. So we actually have a laser of uh, 674 nanometers. Um, and you can calculate the frequency C over lambda, which is then the frequency. And then, of course, h bar omega is actually the energy. So it's on the order of uh, electron volt. It, of course, the energy is taken from the laser. And then, since the, laser, the, the, the levels are long-lived, it, it actually stays there, even though the energy gap is quite big. But uh, it takes the energy from the laser, and it gives it back to the laser by stimulated emission. Okay, so the energy difference doesn't really play such a big role. Further questions? Yes? How do you prefer like, phase gates? How do you prefer uh, make, make phase gates? So uh, rotations around the equator, basically. Um, we would detune our laser with respect to this transition. And uh, if we detune this laser, it doesn't drive directly trans the transition. But what it does is actually it shifts the energy levels due to an AC Stark effect. And this AC Stark effect is usually used, for instance, for dipole traps. Uh, if you want to trap by light fields, you can trap them in a dipole trap. 
And here what we use is just the shift of the energy levels. And if, if there's a shift of energy level, that means the clock is actually ticking faster or slower because of this energy shift. And due to that, you actually can effectively rotate around the z-axis also. So it's, it's another way of doing rotations. Yes. OK. Um, for trapped ions, uh, to do two qubit operations, so between, uh, some, some operation that actually, for instance, makes an operation on one qubit dependent on the state of the other qubits, conditional operations, like the NAND gate that you would have on a classical computer, you would need to have an interaction between these particles, between these qubits, because interaction, there needs to be an exchange of information. And uh, for trapped ions, the interaction is mediated by the trap, by the, the, the harmonic oscillator that is described by, by the trapping of these ions in the trap. So what, we, what you, people usually do is that with these lasers, they give this whole ion string. For instance, here you have an ion string oscillating as a center of mass motion. This is a harmonic oscillator. Um, you can give this harmonic oscillator a kick. You initially prepare it in a ground state. Then you absorb a photon. And this photon absorption means the photon has a momentum due to h bar, h bar k of the photon. And this photon momentum can give this string a kick uh, dependent on whether it was absorbed or not, depending on the instrument state. And with that, you can now get a superposition of the string oscillating or not oscillating, depending on the initial quantum state of this first atom, of first ion. Um, and uh, with that, now all of the other ions know, is it oscillating or not? And you can do conditional operations depending on whether the ion string is oscillating or not. So this is usually... The idea behind this, how to do, how to mediate an interaction between these ions in the string. Um, how does it work in, in, in a bit more in detail? You have the qubit, you have the harmonic oscillator, and uh, for this qubit transition, you can drive this qubit transition directly with the laser, or you can drive so-called sidebands of this transition. And the sideband of the transition is now either blue detuned or red detuned with respect to the direct transition of this. Which means if you blue detune it, you can absorb a photon, but at the same time you can change the quantum state of the harmonic oscillator by plus one, by plus. So if it was in state zero, you can add one quantum of motion. Uh, which means you have to, of course, also add a bit of an additional energy. That is why it is actually blue detuned with respect to this transition. If it's red detuned, you can actually absorb a photon and at the same time reduce the number of excitations of this motion, of this harmonic oscillator. OK, so these are operations that you can use. In reality, for trapped ions, people usually use the Mermersons and entanglement operations, which is a, which is a bit more complicated scheme. I don't want to go too much in detail there. But what actually happens is that two ions next to each other, which are, in, for instance, in the one state, they can absorb a photon first on the red sideband and then on the blue sideband. And or basically, well, let's say one of the ions flips. It absorbs, absorbs one of the photons, adds one quantum of motion. And the second ion flips and takes this quantum of motion out of the, out of the string again. So both of them flipped, and in the meantime, they exchanged one quantum of motion. So effectively, by that, you have like, uh, like a, a virtual particle uh, interacting between the two by the quantum of motion. Uh, they, they can exchange one quantum of motion, and both of them flip. There's different possibilities how this can happen. All of them interfere with each other. And uh, by that, you actually get something that is independent on the initial emotional state, which is actually quite, quite nice. Sorry, can, you, can you actually choose any two ions to be entangled? So the question is whether we can choose, uh, whether, we, uh, uh, whether any of the two ions can be tangled. <coughs> if you address individual ions with this laser, yes, you can do that. So if you address one ion and the second ion that you want to entangle with each other, 
then they can talk with each other via this motional mode. And in principle, all of the ions can talk with each other. Okay, so it's, it's possible that all of them, every one, single one can connect to any other ion in the string because it's a, it's a combined motion. Is it, is it necessary to have this harmonic oscillator to have this exchange of information? Um, yes, it is necessary for this type of scheme um, if you want to use the motion for entanglement operation. But I will show you later on a different method to entangle ions with Rydberg Rydberg interaction, uh, which, which has some advantages, then you don't need the motion mode. So it, there's other possibilities also. Okay, nice thing about that is you can actually start with a string of ions and apply this laser to all of them at the same time. And uh, what happens then is that all of them will be able to talk to all of the other ions. Okay, and uh, with that you can actually generate so-called GZ state, is a specific type of entangled state, which is all ions in one, state one or S, plus all ions in state zero. So you can generate a multi-qubit entangled state uh, with all ions being entangled with all of the others. Um, this has been shown that this works uh, in 2011 up to 14 ion qubits and uh, recently, 2021, up to 24 ion qubits. So you have 24 qubits, all of them are entangled with each other. Okay. So this is currently the record of the biggest entangled state on any system, trapped ions, superconducting qubits, or anything like that. OK, maybe also to give you a bit of an idea, the Hilbert space, for instance, for 14 qubits, uh, is 2 to the power of 14. So there's many, many degrees of freedom in such a big, big Hilbert space. And if you wanted to, to measure to characterize the, the qubit state of a 2 to the 14 big Hilbert space by measure, measuring it. So if you wanted to really look, okay, where it is, is it, our, our, our ions? You actually would need to measure many, many, many different degrees of freedom in all different basis states, in all combinations. And to measure that, you would actually need 55 days continuous measuring, measurement time for only 24, 14 qubits. If you wanted to do that for 24 qubits, a PhD thesis would not be enough to actually measure that. Okay. Could, could actually an experiment to be kept running for 55 days? Can you, can, you measure, can you measure for 55 days? Uh, it's not easy. I guess, I mean, actually, if you would want to trap ions, they stay for a few days inside the trap. But of course, then you need to reload them. But if you always stay with 14 ions, and if the lasers stay locked all the time on resonance and so on. In principle, yes, but it takes also quite a bit of overhead to actually measure that, okay? So you need to calibrate from time to time and so on. So I guess in the end, you would need to measure a whole year. Unfortunately, for, for this GZ state, there's a very, very simple measurement that you can do to characterize this state. Uh, and uh, this is so-called parity oscillations. With that, you can actually measure the fidelity in, in a relatively short time. Um, so you just need to, to measure these oscillations, the amplitude of these oscillations and some populations, and you, you know that you have a multi-qubit entangled state. So the reason for that is that there's only two states involved in that and only two coherences, and you only need to characterize these four numbers, basically. Okay? Good. Okay, I have to probably speed up a bit also to get to Rydberg ions, <laughs> but I think it's, it's good to, to get a bit of an idea what trapped ion quantum computation is. So with these operations, so these individual light shift gates in the, in the uh, collective uh, spin flip operations, so the Rabi oscillations that I showed you, plus this Mermozernsen gate operation, you actually have a full set of operations, which means you can do any arbitrary quantum computation. So this is possible now in 24 ion qubits or up to 50 ion qubits or so to do any arbitrary calculation. 
to give a bit of a uh, uh, state of the art, what is possible with that, as I said, you can entangle up to 24 lines. You can get gates that have an error of below 1%, actually below 10 to the minus 3 of all of the operations that you do. So this is a quite good operation. But if you want to do arbitrary calculation with many, many operations one after the other, you still sometimes make a bit of an error. And that means also sometimes you, you might get a wrong result in the end, okay? Two to these errors. If there's many operations, one after the other after the other. So 10 to the minus three is already fault tolerant. You can do with this, in principle, quantum error correction, correct, correct, correct for error, and then do any, so, so, so computation that is, is corrected for errors. So that in the end you will get the right, correct result. But, of course, the bigger your system is, the more difficult it is to get such good gates. And uh, to do that really with 24 qubits is today not really possible yet. But we are getting better and better with that. OK. The problem is maybe that these entanglement operations are relatively slow. Uh, so one of these gates takes usually on the order of 50 microseconds per gate, uh, which means you can run your quantum computer at 20 kilohertz or so operation speed. Okay. So it's, it's not so fast. If you compare it to superconducting qubits, for instance, or to other systems, they usually have on the order of 100 nanoseconds per gate. So they're on the order of 50 times faster, or uh, 100 times faster, more than 100 times faster than, than our operations in, in trap times. And uh, it's also not so easy to make these fast gates of make, make fast operations in, in large iron crystals. So the bigger you make your iron crystal, the slower these operations actually become. This is a bit of a problem for trapped ions. And, uh, but actually, there's quite a number of companies already, startup companies around the world, that build such quantum computers and that want to sell them. Okay. So sooner or later, you might have not maybe on your table, a quantum computer, but maybe next to, to a big uh, uh, computer center, maybe there's a coprocessor that is, is a quantum computer at some point. Let's, let's see what, how, how this develops. There's a different competing technology, Rydberg atoms. Rydberg atoms, I will get to what, how this technology works in, in a few minutes. Uh, what they have is uh, they have atoms trapped in optical dipole traps. So there's a strong laser focused to a small spot. And in this small spot, as I said before, with this AC stock shift, uh, you can actually trap atoms. And if you then excite these atoms in high, high uh, uh, level, in really high electronic uh, uh, orbitals, then there are so-called Rydberg levels. And the Rydberg levels, they can, they're, they're so big that they actually see if there's a neighboring Rydberg atoms. So they, they, there's a, a so-called dipole-dipole interaction. And with this dipole-dipole interaction, you can get a really, really strong interaction. And the interaction can be megahertz, even gigahertz strength, which means such a gate can be really, really fast. Um, the nice thing is also the dipole traps, you can, orient, you can arrange them quite freely where your focus is. You can make arrays of these foci and then trap in each of these Individual focus, you can trap an individual atom. And with that, you can make 2D arrays, even 3D arrays, or something like that. Uh, so you have a nice possibility for connecting qubits in different directions. You can even move them around by moving your dipole trap and then let different atoms interact with each other. Okay. So it's a nice thing. Um, of course, there's also drawbacks. Um, Usually, if, they want, if, if, people, if these groups want to excite ions in the Rydberg state, the Rydberg state is actually anti-trapped in these dipole traps. And uh, due to that, most of the groups switch off their dipole traps when they excite the Rydberg states. Which means, if it's switched off, of course, the atom is free to move. Okay? And if you wait too long, it probably moved out of your dipole trap. So due to that, um, you cannot do quantum operations infinitely long. You always need to bring them down again, switch off your, on your trap, and then bring it up again, uh, switch off your trap, bring it up for the interaction, 
bring them down again, switch on the trap again. So it's always switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off, switch on, switch off. Switch off. So it, it takes quite a bit of an overhead, and after some time you will lose the atoms. That's a bit of a problem. So this limits how many gate operations you can do in the end. Um, people, of course, working also on alternatives, different types of trapping and so on, blue detuned traps, so that actually the atom is actually trapped not at the maximum of the intensity of these, these uh, laser beams, but actually the minimum of these intensity of the laser beams. But it's getting more and more complicated. Also, there are quite a number of uh, uh, startup companies building quantum computers. And uh, yeah, of course, there's different technologies. All of them are competing with each other. OK, what are now, what is now the thing that we are working on in our lab? Uh, the, what we are doing is that we combine trapped ions and this Rydberg interaction. So also, trapped ions can be excited into Rydberg levels. You still have a dipole-dipole interaction, and the dipole-dipole interaction is quite strong. And now our motivation for that is that we actually want to have ions interaction, interacting via the Rydberg interaction. The nice thing is also the ions are trapped by electric fields, not by these strong laser fields. And uh, due to that, even in the Rydberg state, these ions are trapped, which means we don't need to switch off our trap while we are exciting them into Rydberg states. The drawback is, of course, we cannot rearrange re our ions in arbitrary configurations in 2D uh, crystals, 3D crystals, or anything like that so easily. They are trapped by the electric fields, and this is the arrangement that we have. OK, what can we do with that? So first, give you a bit of an idea what are Rydberg atoms, Rydberg, uh, Rydberg ions. Uh, usually, the orbitals of the electrons are quite close to the core of the atom. If you excite it to a very, very far away orbital, then this is a Rydberg, a Rydberg atom or ion. Uh, typical orbitals that are called Rydberg atoms or ions are if you bring it to the principal quantum number of, let's say, 30, 40, 50, 60, or something like that. So there, the ion gets, or atom gets really, really big due to these large orbitals. OK. How big are they? And so if you excite, if you, if you are in a, in a, in a strontium ion in the ground state, the typical diameter of, diameter of such an uh, orbital is on the order of 0.4 nanometers. Uh, orbital of a quite moderate Rydberg state, 30s, is 40 nanometers, which means 100 times bigger in diameter than an atom in a, uh, the ion in a ground state. If you bring it to, well, 60 or something like that, the diameter actually scales as n to the power of 2 which means if you go two tw twice up, it's already four, four times bigger. Okay? So it gets really, really big. The volume, of course, is the cube of that. So the volume is actually huge. 100 times bigger in diameter means 100 to the power of three times bigger in volume. Okay? If you compare it, of course, it's similar to, for instance, sun to earth ratio. This is the difference between such uh, uh, atom in the ground state and atom in the Rydberg state. Also, it becomes, gets some other properties. The lifetime of these Rydberg atoms or ions scales as the principal quantum number to the power of three, which means the higher up you go, the longer lived they are, actually. Okay. So the reason for that is that the neighboring levels are actually quite getting quite close, and it usually needs to decay via these neighboring levels back to the ground state. And since these are quite close, actually the probability for such a transition is going down and down and down. OK, polarizability goes to the principal quantum now n to the power of 7. And this is the thing that we actually use for a really, really strong interaction. So the interaction scales either as the power of 4 or as the power of 11 in the end. So if you go to higher Rydberg state, they can strongly interact with each other. OK. An ion in ground state and an ion in Rydberg state have quite a bit different dimension. The wave function of this motion that I told you before is somewhere in between. 
but the ion distance between such ions in a trap is really still much bigger, which means if you have a Rydberg ion, the electron wave function is still quite local around one of these ions. It doesn't circle, circulate around two ions or three ions now. So what do you have individual Rydberg ions next to each other? So I, I wanted to get an idea of uh, thresholds because you're getting the electrons really far away from the nucleus. Don't you risk the electron just leaving? <laughs> uh, or, so, are we, or are we talking about really large, must, the numbers must be really larger? So yeah. the, the energy that you need from a typical Rydberg ion or atom on the order of n equal to 50 to go to the continuum is still a few 10 millivolts, milli electron volts, which means at room temperature, a black body radiation photon can bring it to the continuum, but it's still, if you cool it, for instance, to cryogenic temperature, there's no way that it will go from this Rydberg level to the continuum. Okay. Of course, you have electric fields around it. The electric fields, in principle, could bring it to the continuum, but if you stay at n equal to 50, this doesn't really happen. Okay. So, of course, if you go to n equal to 100, Yes, and we have a problem. Okay. Comparison, maybe quickly, to between Rydberg atoms and Rydberg ions. I said Rydberg atoms, they are trapped by these dipole traps, and usually you need to switch off these traps because the dipole trap actually, the, the Rydberg atoms are not trapped in these dipole traps. Due to that, they would actually roll out if you want to would excite them to Rydberg state. Also, the, the laser field actually might ionize it. On the other hand side, Rydberg ions, they stay trapped in, in our ion trap, and due to that, maybe we have an advantage compared to Rydberg atoms. Of course, if we want to excite to Rydberg states, we need quite a bit of energy. Uh, we have a strontium ion, for instance, in our system, and a strontium ion, one needs actually, if one wants to excite it to Rydberg level, one needs wavelengths on the order of 100 nanometers to bring it to a Rydberg, Rydberg state. So it's quite a lot of energy. 100 nanometers is something in the UV, very quite far in the UV, actually. Um, and uh, you don't really have such lasers so easily available. And on the other hand side, if you go below 200 nanometers, air is actually absorbing this light. So uh, if you just have a laser standing around here somewhere on a table and you want to send it to your, your ions, you cannot go through air anymore. You would need to make a vacuum tube or something like that. It's very, very demanding. So what we actually do instead is, well, actually, there was a group in, in mines. Apart from us, there's only a second group doing these Rydberg ions in mines. They actually used 120 nanometers to excite into Rydberg state. Um, but... Uh, they had problems with their laser. In the end, they also switched to a system like we had. OK, what do we do? Uh, we start here in the qubit state 0 that I introduced here before. And we excite our ions into Rydberg states by a so-called two-photon transition. So we have two lasers. And these two lasers now bring it first into an intermediate state by the first laser, and then into a Rydberg state by the second laser. So the wavelengths here are all larger than 200 nanometers, which means all of them go through air, and they're more or less commercially available. So by that, we can actually have a system that is not too complicated. Of course, it's still expensive, but you can build such a system with, with commercial lasers, basically. If you excite the ions into Rydberg state with this two-photon transition and just wait, it will decay back either to initial state or to ground state. And if you uh, calculate the ratio between these two possibilities, 95% of the population will actually go back to the ground, to this S1, 5S1 ground state, which means if you want to detect now, if you were to excite it to Rydberg state, you can just look, get, do you get a population transfer between the initial state to state one? OK, the lasers that we're using are as I said, a commercial laser. You start at an infrared wavelength. You double it first and double it second time in this laser. 
and then in the end you have a UV light. So it's quite a big system, something like that. Um, in the end, you get to something like 30 milliwatts out of this laser. The other laser is a, is a self-built system. We use two lasers that we first mix with each other in a some frequency generation, which generates us such nice orange light. And then we double this to generate 305 nanometers for, for the second transition. OK, we have this light. We shine it to our ions. Uh, if we start in initial state, we can excite it into Rydberg state. I said the, initial, the, the final state is bright. The initial state is dark. And if we want to detect where we're exciting to Rydberg state, we just need to see, does it go from dark to bright? Um, the way we excite these ions into Rydberg states is by uh, this two-photon transition. We uh, use these two lasers. We can adiabatically map the ions into Rydberg state. Uh, if you look, so-called stimulated Raman adiabatic passage is an adiabatic process to bring it in a three-level system from the initial state to the final state. So you have a three-level system. The first laser couples the initial state to the immediate state. This is this omega p. And the second laser couples the intermediate state to the final state, which is this omega c, the Rabi frequency of this coupling. This three-level Hamiltonian here has eigenstates. And one of the eigenstates is the so-called dark eigenstate, which doesn't contain the intermediate level. And by changing the ratio of these two lasers, omega c and omega p, basically by changing just the intensity of these two lasers, we can prepare the ion initially in the state 0, switch off this part here. So omega p is off, meaning the laser, lower laser is off only the upper laser is on, then the zero state is actually equal to the dark state. If we now slowly switch on our lower laser, what happens is that the system will adiabatically follow this dark eigenstate. And with that, we then map the population from the state zero to the Rydberg state. OK, so just a little bit of quantum mechanics. If we do that, um, we can map the population into Rydberg state. We can bring it down again after a certain amount of time, waiting time. And with that, we can actually show, due to the lifetime that we measure, how much we can bring back from the Rydberg state back to the initial state. We can actually show how long it was in the Rydberg state. And this is quite consistent with the lifetime of these Rydberg states. The efficiency for this process, for bringing it into Rydberg state, is larger than 90%. Here we had 91%, but in the meantime, we have excited, are able to go to above 95%. And with a little bit better focusing and more laser powers, we can bring that up to close to 100%. OK, why do we do that? How much time do I still have? So something like maximum 5, 10 minutes? OK. Why do we do that? Well, it has a couple of applications. One of the central points is we want to do fast quantum gates. And uh, this is what I will focus now in the rest of my talk on. Um, so quantum gates, uh, Rydberg interaction is usually, the way, way you usually do gates with Rydberg interaction is you use actually so-called Rydberg blockade. Rydberg blockade is an effect where if you have two atoms or ions next to each other, you excite one of these atoms or ions into a Rydberg state. Then you want to excite a second ion or atom into a Rydberg state. And, but two ions or atoms next to each other in the Rydberg state inter interact with each other. Depending on the distance, there's interaction that shifts this energy level a little bit bigger, a little bit further due to this interaction, or a little bit less. For instance, a dipole-dipole interaction has an energy shift that is proportional to 1 over the distance of these atoms or ions to the power of 3. Which means if the ions or atoms are close to a, like 5 micrometers next to each other, there's quite a strong energy shift already, meaning if you excite one of these atoms or ions into the Rydberg state, now the laser is not resonant anymore to excite the ions into the, sec the, the second ion or atom into the Rydberg state. And due to that, it, it cannot be excited anymore. So there's a blockade. The first atom or ion in the Rydberg state 
blocks the second atom or ion to go to the Rydberg state. This is the so-called Rydberg blockade. So there's an interaction happening between them, and this you can use for quantum gates. Um, I don't want to go too much in detail there. We use direct dipole-dipole interaction. The dipole-dipole interaction in our case is due to the fact that we drive transitions between Rydberg states by a microwave field. Um, the microwave field induces a dipole, and the induced dipole between of two of these ions next to each other, if you have induced dipoles, they, there's a direct dipole-dipole interaction. Normal Rydberg atom experiments use a van der Waals interaction. Van der Waals interaction is a second order effect uh, of this dipole dipole interaction. And due to that, it actually scales as the distance to the power of minus six, since it's a second order quantum effect. Uh, unfortunately for ions, this effect is too weak due to the fact that we have a doubly charged core, uh, which pulls the, ion, the, the electron closer to the core. And due to that, this effect is smaller. Uh, there's, due to that, the interaction scales as the effective core charge of the ions to the power of six, and this makes it relatively small. So this is why we need, actually, a dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, I don't want to go too much in detail how we do that. If you have now two of these ions next to each other in a trap, you excite them into Rydberg state. Due to the microwave, you induce dipoles, so the, the dipole actually makes them interact with each other. Uh, you have dipole-dipole interaction, and due to that, now you should observe such a Rydberg blockade. Okay, first we do an experiment without this microwave. So the microwave induces dipoles, I said. If you don't have these dipoles, there's no interaction. Only van der Waals interaction. The van der Waals interaction, I said, is very, very weak. And uh, which means if we now excite one of these ions in the Rydberg state, the second ion can go to Rydberg state because there's an interaction. There's no energy level shift. If we now observe, uh, observe the time evolution of exciting ions in the Rydberg state, uh, we see that if we want to excite two ions in the Rydberg state, we can actually do that. So this is a single ion going into Rydberg state. The red curve is a two ions going into Rydberg state. And the probability for one ion going to Rydberg state and the probability for two ions going to Rydberg state is just p squared of the single ion probability. Okay, so it's an independent process. One ion going to Rydberg state and two ions going to Rydberg state is just p versus p squared. If we do that now with microwave field on, then there's this interaction happening. And the interaction happening means the green curve here is a single ion going to Rydberg state, and the red curve is the second ion going into Rydberg state. So the red second ion in the Rydberg state actually doesn't happen anymore. The p and the p squared is not anymore this relation. So the two ions going into Rydberg state is suppressed. We can excite the first ion into Rydberg state, but the second ion doesn't go into Rydberg state anymore. So we see this Rydberg blockade, and we can use this now for entanglement operations. OK, so there's, this is now the experimental realization of this entanglement operation. We have a specific scheme of pulses that we apply. I don't want to go too much in detail how we do that. But the whole time that we need for doing this is 700 nanoseconds. So compared to 50 microseconds that I said, it's usually the gate time that trapped iron uh, quantum gates take. 700 nanoseconds is a factor of, well, well, almost 100 faster than this 50 microseconds, which means we can now make an entanglement operation in only 700 nanoseconds, of course, between two ions next to each other. The mechanism that we use is actually, we actually, we don't really use the Rydberg blockade. We actually excite both ions into Rydberg state, and due to interaction, you have this energy level shift. And the energy level shift means now the time is clicking, the, 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 the clock is ticking faster, or uh, there's a shift. And if the clock is ticking faster and you wait for a certain amount of time, you get an extra phase. And this extra phase is actually a minus sign after the right amount of time that you wait. Okay. So with that, you get a minus sign for both ions being excited to Rydberg state. If only one of the ions is excited to Rydberg state, there's no interaction. 
Due to that, no phase shift. And due to that, you don't get any phase. If both ions, if none of the ions is excited to triple state, you don't have energy level shift, you don't get a phase. So with that, you get such a time evolution. One ion gets, uh, both ions being excited to triple state gets a minus sign. All the others don't get a minus sign. And this is so-called controlled phase gate. So it's a one type of entanglement operation that you can define for quantum computation. With having a, such a controlled phase gate you have, and, and arbitrary single qubit rotations, you have a uh, universal set of quantum operations. So you can do arbitrary quantum gates, uh, quantum calculations. OK, so we are currently limited in the fidelity to something like 80%. So 20% of the times, you actually have a mistake in your calculation. Okay. This is due to this, the, the, the power, laser powers. It mostly has technical limitations at the moment. But uh, we know how to make this better. So I think we can make it up to 99% or better than 99% soon. I don't want to go too much into what type of errors we have and so on. I think uh, that's going a little bit for too, too, too far now for, for this lecture. So what do we have? We have a fast gate. Compared to a typical iron gate, it's a factor of 50 typically faster. So we think that from typical 10 kilohertz gate operation speed for trapped ions, we can reach more than megahertz. And this is actually competitive to any other uh, quantum computation technology. So we think that we can make trapped ion quantum computers as fast as superconducting quantum computers. We can also operate that in, more than, in, in a string of 12 ions, two ions in the center. So it's the same speed, similar fidelity. So we think that even in large crystals, we can operate such quantum computation, such, such, such quantum gates. OK, I'll skip this part of the motion. Maybe a bit of an idea how where, where this field goes. Uh, basically, we can also integrate such ions, ions on, on chips. So we can trap them on a chip on electrodes on a chip. With that, we have possibilities to trap more and more ions on a chip, and with that, scale it to a large number of ion qubits. This is a collaboration, for instance, uh, with uh, Infineon, and uh, a uh, semiconductor company. OK. Um, I think for that, I would then summarize. So what we have done in our lab is that we combined rhythm, uh, trapped ion and Rydberg atom technologies. We uh, see quite a lot of new physics in the system that we, of course, first needed to understand. But what we actually managed to do now is we made really, really fast quantum gates. Of course, we need to still make them really high, highly, highly efficient with low, low errors. And uh, we need to show that we can operate these gates in, in really large iron crystals. Uh, so we want to make them fast and scalable. There's quite a number of other things that one can do with these Rydberg ions. Uh, but it's a new system that combines basically red back atoms and trapped ions. I would like to thank the team that did all of these experiments. Uh, so in particular, two or three PhD students up here. Also, we have a collaboration with uh, here Celso's group in uh, San Carlos. Uh, and uh, here, uh, Alan and Andre uh, are two postdocs in theory. Uh, visiting us for a year. They're helping us to understand our systems better. And uh, of course, yes, I also, also want to, to mention all the theory collaborators that we have on the system, in particular, Salso and Oma from San Carlos. Also, we need a bit of money for doing that, so these are the funding agencies. And uh, thanks for your attention. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions. OK, any questions? Uh, as you get your system larger, you, you need to increase that to, to reach uh, full-size quantum computer. 
then your the the number of modes, vibration modes also gets very complicated. Yes. So how how do you manage it to, with this problem? So for 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 um, normal trapped ion quantum computing, um, I maybe didn't really show that too much in detail. The I typical idea is that you have uh, different trapping zones uh, where you actually have smaller strings, smaller ion crystals with limited number of motional modes. So you have a processing zone here where you can calculate with a limited number of motional modes. And then you have a memory zone at some other region where you store them if you don't want to calculate with them. The nice thing about trapped ions is that these qubits will live really for a very, very long been, time. It has been tested, this, this, this scheme here? Yes, it, has it, been tested. It, 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 is, it is used, yes. So for instance, uh, the group in, in Mainz that also does Rittberg ions is using that quite a lot, the, the shifting ions around. They have uh, done some topological qubit uh, on such a system with shifting ions around. Also, um, um, Continuum in Boulder is a company they are actually, I think they have at the moment the largest uh, uh, no, quantum volume. In system quantum volume is usually the, the, the has, has been introduced by IBM, superconducting quantum computers. And trapped ions are actually currently leading in the quantum volume of one can, what can be used. They also shift ions around uh, on, on a chip and uh, have different regions where they do different operations in memory regions and so on. Yeah. So this is, this is being used. Of course, shifting takes also a lot of time, uh, a long time. And if you shift them around, you might need to cool them again to bring these ions into close to the emotional ground state. And this puts a lot of extra overhead. So it makes it even slower. And uh, we hope that with the Rittbeck ion technology, we can speed it up and also in, in the large ion crystals uh, make operations. I think we don't really need to go to cool our ion string close to the motional ground state because we don't depend on the motion for this interaction. We, our gates doesn't, does not need a motional ground state. Uh, so with that, even if we have many, many motional modes, if they're relatively cool, if, they, if the ions stay close enough together and don't move too much with respect to each other, uh, then the gate fidelity shouldn't be influenced too much by that. Thank you. Uh, Sam Professor for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. The first is just to check if I understand well how to manipulate the qu one qubit from the ground state to the excited state. You say that you, uh, you apply two pulses or two lasers. You apply one to go to the E state and then another to go to the R state, right? Yes. But you in the presentation uh, show that there is a decay in the E state to the, uh, maybe it's in the, yes, there. Uh, yes, any yes. of these two. So in order to go, for example, to the ground state, to the one state, uh, you apply the two pulses, and then you wait to the decay that is expressed with that uh, blue line. Mm -hmm. How much is the time that it takes to decay? I have to wait in order to. So to decay from up here to down here is a few microseconds. But we usually don't wait. For, for this decay to happen. Uh, um, so we, we have our qubit, the excited to back state, but before it decays, we actually want to bring it back to the ground state, uh, to, to, to lower line, to a qubit state. We only bring it to a back state for making an interaction, for making a gate, and then we bring it back to the qubit basis, basically. But so, 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 so who, who you go from the zero state to the one state, I say? From between these two, we can directly drive uh, transition with a laser. Uh, where is it? OK. Here's the zero state. Here's the one state, just in, in reverse order. We can directly drive this transition here with a laser, directly manipulate our qubit. Uh, OK. Only if we want to operate a two-qubit gate, uh. then we bring it into these Rydberg states. Then we have this interaction. But we don't wait for the mm. ion to decay for the gate to happen, because we, we just bring it up, wait for it to interaction, yes, yes, exactly. and bring it back down. OK, OK. 
And the, the process, and that second question is the process that you use for, for example, for a single qubit gate and a two qubit gate is based on the Rabi oscillation, right? So you apply a resonant pulse equal to the. So all of this is, of course, uh, mm. coherent manipulation with Rabi oscillations. Mm. Because if, in fact, you, you can use another uh, protocol to manipulate it that could be uh, in, uh, give faster uh, operation. And you so, um, of course, you can, can look into shortcuts to adiabaticity and things like that to make things faster. Mm. Uh, there's, there's possibilities with pulse lasers yeah. and so on to, mm -hmm. to, okay, to yes. make things faster, yes, in principle. So you, you, not everything needs to be perfectly yeah, adiabatic yes. or so. You can, there, there are schemes for making it faster. And also the interaction that we have here, the, me the, the mechanism to shift light, sh to, to shift due to interaction is one possibility. You can think about different mechanisms for, for making a gate. How to get, for instance, a, a face from such an interaction. Okay, thank you. More questions? <laughs> no? Okay. Okay. Let's thank Professor Marx again. Thank you.